people's names who fought for this country and died for our freedom. We're one of the few nations I know on this earth that has the freedom we got, but it came through a price. Amen, a very steep price. My uh, grandfather was a paratrooper in World War II. My dad peeled potatoes in the Army. That's all he'll tell me. See, Dad, what'd you do? My, my grand, his, his grandson begs him, Dad, what'd you do? He said, I peeled potatoes. He said, that's what I did. Uh, Pastor Bob said something to me, and I believe it to be true. A lot of the men who, and women who have been in the military, particularly who saw war, they don't talk much about it. Amen. But my dad wouldn't tell me that. He peeled potatoes, which is another way of saying he got in a lot of trouble. He was always in trouble. Amen. And uh, my mom verified that with me. You got your Bibles. You, you can open to 1 Peter chapter 2. I'll be there in just a minute. When we think of memorials, we think of monuments. And we'll see monuments tomorrow in Arlington Cemetery, other places where people have gone to uh, be remembered. They do not have a, yet have a voice, yet memorials speak. When I walk by them, I think of my own epithet. When I'm gone, what would somebody put on my, what Jerryism, Cheryl, would you put on my epithet? Amen. I think everybody needs something. It's always about the dash, that which lies in between. But I love reading something about somebody's life. Perhaps what they did here matters there. Amen. But something that was said of them, something that, that mattered to the individuals and the families that were connected. They do not have ears. Memorials don't, yet they hear. They do not have a mind, yet they stand for memory. We see that them in cemeteries. I'm a cemetery buff. I walk through cemeteries. I look for old war uh, memorials. I read them. Amen. I stand over them. I pause for a moment. I told the men yesterday, and, and let me just say this to you, that anytime somebody passes, we're doing a lot of cremations now, and I don't see anything wrong with that because absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The body will decay no matter what you do with it. But here's the thing. I believe in memorial stones. I believe there needs to be a stone somewhere that represents the life of that person, amen, because what they did here does matter, amen, and they mattered. Can I get an amen? Amen. So I think a stone is appropriate for wherever you may. Some people put benches, whatever you want to do, amen. I think it's important to do that for people. I have a car that has the man's ashes that once owned the car in the back of the car. Y'all know that, right? Amen. That matters. It mattered to him. He told me, Pastor, when I die, I want to ride in that car. Amen. I'm just glad he said, I, I'm glad he didn't tell me I want to be buried in that car. Because I get to drive that car till Jesus comes. Can I get an amen? Amen. So his ashes are there. Do we decide where to put old Rodney? But it'll happen someday. Amen. We see them at historical war sites, on buildings. The scripture is very specific about memorials from Genesis to Revelation. Stones have stood for many things, from altars to victories. The use of the word stone in scripture found in Psalm 118, verse 22, the stone which the builders refused has become the headstone of the corner. When we do, uh, last week when we took communion, that has a memorial to it. It has a connection to remind us of the sacrifice of Christ for us. Churches, a lot of churches have corners cornerstones like this church does and others. That cornerstone is often a memorial to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. First Peter chapter 2 verse 4 says, as you come to him, the living stone, stone memorial, rejected by men but chosen by God and precious to him. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. It calls us living stones. Look at these walls. These walls are bricks. These bricks are uniform. Every brick is the same. Same width, same height, amen, same length. Every brick's the same. God said, I don't build with bricks. If he built with bricks, we would all be the same. We'd all have blonde hair. Amen. We'd all be five foot four. We would all look the same, talk. We'd all be of the same political persuasion. I said last week in the other service, I don't care if you Democrat, Republican, red, yellow, black, white, you're welcome in this church. Amen. Because only here can God change your life. I saw a dog going to preach and jumping up and screaming like, like, uh, 
uh, Yosemite Sam, amen, screaming, telling Democrats to get out of his church. and, and all. Hey, Listen, I understood what he was doing, but he was going about it the wrong way. When I got born again, if you'd have known me before I went to that church, you would not have wanted me in your church. Amen. And I've known some of you before you got born again, you wouldn't have been a whole lot of fun to be around. But God gives us opportunity. He builds with stones. Stones are shaped different. Stones are, are some have sharp edges. Some have uh, sw- sloops uh, and lively stones, which means you're always moving, which we had a lot of folk moving today, didn't they? Amen. But you're always moving. So God puts these stones together. And, and if you know anything about that, he's got to find the right stone. And this stone, he puts us and he connects us together. And, and then there's that grace that flows between us. Can I get an amen? Amen. It keeps us going. But don't miss the point here. We're talking about him being a living stone and being rejected by men. You also living stones. Then it goes on to see I lay in Zion a chosen. Zion is the church a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. How Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. So the very memorial that we serve was once rejected by people and now being received. The purpose of uh, memorials to remind you of God's goodness. I walk around and I realize I'll see a memorial. God is good. I walk on this property, I walk outside, and I see a bench there. That bench was given to us by Sterling White Memorial Funeral Home. And I think, God, you're so good. Because there was a day I drove away from a school, and I said, God, I'm tired of having church in school. I'm tired of having church in this school. I'm tired of setting up chairs in this school. I'm tired of coming out here at 6 o'clock. And God spoke to me as clear as some of you have got in my ear. And he said to me, I gave you a place. I said, where, God? He said, go to Sterling White. They'll give you a free place to have church. I went there that Monday morning, walked in, talked with Jeff. Jeff said, you want to use our place? You can have it on Sunday. We got a coffee room, a breakout room. Every now and then you got to push push a, a casket out of the way. But as a rule, you can use this funeral home as long as you want. We stayed in that funeral home for two years. It was a memorial when I see that stone that for two years, you guys came to church here in Crosby and Highlands area and and Barrett Station, amen, and Dayton. You came from Channel View, and you went to church in that funeral home for two years. Sister Linda, we raised $200,000 in that church. We did, you know, everything came in. It was free because we got free rent. Nobody charged us rent. I love when God favors his favorite. Mm, come on, G. And I'm walking out of there. One day, I remember flying back from California. Amen. Drove through this place. Saw this building. Saw this building. Went, caught, made a call on it. We had $200,000 to put down on it. That guy I mentioned to you that's in the trunk of my car, he's actually in the back seat. When he died, he left his home to our church. He said, I want the church to have it. We sold his home. We took that $200,000. We mixed that together. And we put a large down payment on $680,000 that we needed to buy this place. Amen. Then the people that loaned us money to buy the ranch came in here and said, we'll give you another $200,000 on top of that so you can pay this thing off quickly. We paid everything off in just a few years. So I walk into this place and I think, thank God. Got a phone call a couple years ago from Representative Chick-fil-A. Said, we'd like to buy your church. Ah, you want to buy our church? How much? $2.5 million. I said, wow. That'd be a pretty good investment, six hundred eighty thousand, and make two point five billion. But you can't find this place anywhere else. Amen. So I said, no, we're not selling. Guess who's next door now? That's right, Chick Fil A, right next door, right on the other side of Burger King building. But then that's all right because I, I feel like God gave us this place. And when I see that stone, when I walk outside, I'm remi- it's a memorial. Amen. I appreciate the miracles of God in our life. Can I get an amen? amen? To remind us of God's goodness, to remember our loved ones by, for your children and others to know, to remember the sacrifices of war. Joshua said when they crossed over the Jordan, they took the, the presence of God, the feet of the priest touched the water, the water split just like it did for Moses at the Red Sea. And as they went across, he said, get stones, pick them up out of there, stack them on the other side so that everybody knows that it was flood season at flood stage. It wasn't an easy walk in a cross. At flood stage, we came across this, and these stones are a memorial to let everybody know the goodness of God in our life. Stones are a good thing. Amen. Memorials are a good thing. Hallelujah. He said that all the people of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is with us. So let us first start by saying thanks. 
Frank, when I hear about your brother, I say thanks. James, when I hear about your uncle, I say thanks. They're not like having a namesake. I'm named after my uncle. Amen. It means a lot to me. Uh, he, he, he didn't die in war, but uh, he died from gunshot wounds. But I thank God that God uses a, a man that, that came through that kind of family life. And I'll go back and I still remember. Can I get an amen? Amen. I still stare at his tombstone, and I thank God for my Uncle Jerry. Amen. So we start by saying thank you. Romans 13, 7 says, Render therefore to all their tribute. Tribute due and honor to those honor is due. And we should honor them today and thank God for their sacrifice, for them stepping up, and a special thanks to those who sacrificed all. You know, sacrifice is giving up something valuable or important for somebody or something else considered being of more value or importance. So sacrifice says this. When I died, it meant that you were more important than my own life. When Jesus died on the cross, he's saying, my sacrifice means you were more important than my own life. And then he goes on to say, no greater love than this than for a brother to lay down his life for a brother. People ask me at times, Pastor, what do you think about suicide? And I said, which one? Are you talking about a selfish suicide or selfless? When a man would throw himself on a grenade for his brothers or sisters. For somebody to push somebody out of the way of traffic and allow a vehicle to hit them, that's the same suicide. But that suicide's a little bit different. Amen. So I always have to ask the question there. And then I got to let God be God. Can I get an amen? Because I don't know the state of the person that passed. It's something valued. When we pledge allegiance to the flag, amen, it would, would tell, and, and then we, we look at our money. That little sister I gave that money to, did you know that $5 bill says in God we trust? Did you know all the money you got says in God we trust? Amen. That came out of Scripture. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and all your ways. Acknowledge Him. We pull from the Word of God all the time because this nation does. Amen. To remind people that things are about God. You know, so to me, when I read in God, we trust. And I'll say it again and again. Trust God. Love people. Amen. Don't get that backwards. You trust people, they'll let you down. They can't help themselves because they're people. But God Himself, He don't let us down. So you trust God, you love people. When you love people and they let you down, love covers a multitude of sins, failures, missteps, mistakes. You, keep, you, you figure out how to keep on loving. Can I get an amen? Amen. Now, Charlie, congratulations on your uh, anniversary, by the way. Hallelujah. And to Holland, I can't forget you, darling. Amen. Holland, throw your hand up in the air. Hallelujah. I appreciate this young lady. She just graduated out of college, and now she is the Huffman head soccer coach. So, Coach Vaughn, we got another coach in the house. Amen. So I got to say, uh, I just got to throw honor where honor is due there. So when I say uh, the words, in God we trust, it's not some off-the-wall right-wing political slogan to me. It's a slogan I've carried in, in my billfold since I was picking cotton as a little boy. Amen. I saw it written on the coins. It's our national motto. It's engraved in every stone and every house of representatives in our capital. It's printed on our currency. We adopted this motto because men and women on Christian principles founded this nation. And I know there's a push. There's a hard push right now in this nation to erase history, all kind of history. But my friend, this is clearly documented throughout our history. If it is appropriate for our motto to be inscribed in the halls of our highest level of governments, then I believe it's certainly appropriate to be displayed on the walls of our schools and allow prayer back in our school again in order to get God back in where we get into a place where we're just not talking about... Uh, <laughs> What's the word? Mental disturbance? Mental health. Listen, I've never met anybody that was really good. That, oh, let me say this different. We all got mental issues. Everybody got something. You get something. You know what I'm saying? Everybody got something. Amen. So I think it's very important to get back to the spiritual issues here. Amen. And remind ourselves that we need God. God's in our pledge, our national anthem, nearly every patriotic song, in our founding documents. We honor Christ's birth. We honor his death. We honor his resurrection as holidays. And we turn to him in prayer in time of crisis and, and praise in times of victory. <clears throat> Don't tell me that the thousands of men and women who sacrificed their lives did it for an atheist nation. They did not. Amen. They did it because they believed and they hold these truths that we are one nation under God, and as long as we favor the Father, the Father will favor us. 
When we quit favoring him, we're in trouble. So freedom is always unfinished business because evil does exist. Why did this happen again, Pastor? Because evil does exist. It has not gone away. Amen. It's something we still deal with. John 10, 10, the thief comes only to what? Steal, kill, murder, and destroy. But I've come that you may have life, and life may to the full. So what do you want to do? You want to hang out over here with Mr. Steal, Kill, and Destroy? Or would you like to be over here with fullness of life? Amen. When things just get better and better. Hallelujah. When you pray and things happen. Over here, wickedness, meanness, evil. Over here, light. Over here, darkness. Amen. I'm going to stick with the light. Can I get an amen? Because right can never be wrong. Isaiah 520. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Because of the fall of man. Romans 512. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all men because all have sinned. Amen. Darkness came into the world. And the only way we're going to get out of this is through light. Amen. To get to know him. Today, you and I live in an environment of privilege. Man, we are privileged. I got in my car, and I came all the way here 30 miles and didn't go through one checkpoint. I didn't have anybody pointing a gun at me. Pastor Bob told me he drove his RV all the way from California to here, and the only time that he had thought he might need a gun is when a biker went around him and gave him a, a that, what would you call that face? St stink eye. Gave him the stink eye. And he said, I don't know why he did that. I was driving right, and I was doing good. And I said, Pastor Bob, it's because you got California tags on your vehicle. You know, it's, a, it's, it's just the way it is down here. Can I get an amen? It's such a, a place of privilege, such a great place. It's been a prosperity and peace like few people have ever experienced in the history of mankind. Because of their sacrifice, you and I can enjoy freedom. Amen. Bought by their, what they did for us. Soldiers, sailors, Marines, airmen, service members, young and old, men and women from every branch of military service died defending our country, liberty, and our way of life. They fight in popular and unpopular wars in countries all over the world. They carry the American flag and the ideas and values for which it stands. To every corner of the world, they don't go for the glory, honor, or fame. They go because they're duly elected officials who represent American people, including you and I, ask them to place themselves in harm's way. They sacrifice family, friends, and often their lives to serve their country. The Scripture tells us that there is no greater love they wanted to lay down their life for another. Our fallen comrades have demonstrated that love, and that is what this day is all about. Now, I'm going to talk to you very quickly about soldiers. When I read this the first time, this would be 30 years ago probably, Paul said, endure hardship as a good soldier of Christ. Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one's servant as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. For too long, we've pleased ourselves. We've done what self wants to do. If self says do this, we do it. But we have forgotten to remind ourselves that we are good soldiers in a battle of Christ Jesus, and we want to please him. Yesterday, I told our men that you can't say thy will be done till you say my will needs to go. Amen, what I want to do. And I just say this not to condemn or beat you up, but perhaps God will put a little conviction in all of our hearts that it's not about what we want to do. It's what, the, so what, what our commander wants us to do. So Paul related life to the military. He said, you be a good soldier. Amen. And a good soldier doesn't get entangled over here. Amen. He doesn't run off to other places. He stays into the battle. Amen. He reminds himself of that. So good soldiers understand if you're going to be a good soldier, you need to be a good follower. Then the Scripture teaches us to be followers of Christ. It actually tells us we can be followers of one another as long as others are following Christ. Amen. To emulate others. No one can be a good leader who cannot first be a good follower. In the military, there is almost always someone in rank above you, those whose orders you got to follow. We have a commanding officer, amen, our King of kings, our Lord of lords, amen, to listen to him and hear the instructions that he would say to us. Good soldiers understand they're in a fight. They're trained, they're taught to be aggressive when necessary. They will not cower or retreat in the face of the enemy. <clears throat> they, will not, well, they will defend their own in honor of, the, of their country. To us as believers, fight the good fight of faith. So there it is again. Paul brings up this military eye. Fight the good fight of faith. You're going through 
a disease, fight the good fight of faith. You're struggling relationally, fight the good fight of faith. You're struggling financially, fight the good fight of faith. It's faith that brings things into our lives. Amen. I believe God for something and it happens. Amen. That's what faith do. Hallelujah. He said, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you have made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. That's why I tell you, don't be afraid to confess Jesus. And by the way, confessing Jesus is more than a bumper sticker. Can I get an amen? Amen. You see, telling somebody, and they don't mean going around hurting people's feelings, but when you get the opportunity to tell somebody, why are you so blessed? Let me tell you about my daddy. Let me tell you about the light in which I live. Let me tell you where I came from and where I'm at right now. Amen. Jesus has been good to me. Amen. He's been very good to me. The verb fight in the Greek New Testament is present tense, suggested not letting up. It is a command and not a suggestion. Good soldiers become familiar. You know, I became very familiar with a man on the front row. Pastor Bob, I call him Bishop Bob. And I did that for a reason. Amen. But I appreciated him for coming here in 2017 and helping us with a whole crew of guys known as craftsmen for Christ and women. Came back during uh, 2019 with Imelda, Harvey and Imelda. When our buildings were devastated, they came and gave us help, David, when we were wore out. I mean, we were flat wore out. Three months later, they came in and helped. It's not the immediate response that always helps out. Sometimes immediate response to a crisis can cause confusion. Amen. Sometimes you've got to back away and give it a little time. And that's what we learn. And then when, when they're wore out, go in and help them out. Breathe fresh air into us. Help you familiar. You've got to get familiar with people. Do you know that certain folk that I can't, uh, I'm a, I, I, I pick at people. I just pick at them. Charlie, just pick. Just, you know, just, I, and, and if you don't hide your button and I find it, mm, I might mash that button, watch a little reaction, you know, a little something. You know, some of you football people in here, you know I'm going, I'm going to be hunting buttons here in about 80 days. Hallelujah. But listen, 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 listen to me. Amen. But, but that don't mean I may push them. If I get familiar with you and find out pushing that button is going to hurt your feelings, I probably won't push it. I'll back away. I'll cut you some slack. you got to become familiar. If I go into a fight, I want to know you're able to stand with me. If I need, I, who do I go to for prayer? I'm going to find a prayer warrior. Normally, it's a grandma. Amen. If grandmas can pray you into heaven, amen, they can get you out of hell. Can I get an amen? So I, I find people that are familiar. So if you're going into fight, you need to find somebody, a good soldier knows who's familiar, amen, who's gone through things before. First, they're familiar with the strategy of the enemy. You've got to know their tricks, habits, warfare, style, and, and, and then prepare. Can I tell you that Satan has been doing the same thing for 5,000 years? He's my enemy, Satan is. And all he's ever done is kill, steal, and destroy, and he's always used the same stuff, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. He's never changed it, just uses it on different people. Every time another generation comes, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. That's what he throws at us over and over and over again. He tried it on Jesus in, in, in the Scripture where he took him on a high place and told him he'd give him all this if he jumped. He told him to turn, turn the stone into bread after 40 days of fasting and eat that. He tried to work him through lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. And Jesus kept saying, it's written, it's written, it's written. Amen. He kept using the Word of God back on him. Secondly, they're familiar with the skills concerning their weaponry. A good soldier knows how to use his weapons. Let me mention this to you and me. We all need to practice our guns a little bit more. I say it with love. Don't hand somebody a handgun and, and just tell them, here, help them learn know how to shoot it, how to load it, what to do with it, anything, anything with military, uh, how to lock the house up. How to secure something. Amen. How to, you know, look, listen, if you hit the lock and all your doors unlock, lady, you need to get somebody to show you how to only one door needs to unlock. Because you don't want to unlock a vehicle in a parking lot and have somebody else jump in on the other side. That's just good preaching right there and practical. Amen. I just, it's just things you got to watch out for. So when I'm reading this and I'm thinking about what a good soldier, he's familiar. He understands his weapons. Mil you know, I, I read it years ago, uh, and it's actually the bumper sticker on my old truck. Military sniper once said, you, you can run, but you'll just die tired. Amen. That's, that's, uh, you'll catch that later. Thirdly, they're familiar with the shadows of their friends. The good soldier is not only looking out for themselves, but they're also for their friends. There's a mutual need for being close to other soldiers as you fight the enemy. I love this family. I love this house. 
I'm familiar with the people in this house. And when you get familiar with people, then, amen, you learn how to stand with them, you laugh with them, you cry with them. Tuesday, I will do a funeral of a dear friend of mine. He's 59 years old, died of a heart attack last week. His name was Johnny Clark. Johnny Clark parked cars for our church when we first started. He was a man who, who stood with me through a whole lot of stuff, and now he's just passed. Amen. I'm familiar with my friends. Amen. I remember them, and I fight with them. Good soldiers understand the need to be faithful, and I'll start closing here. Endure hardness as a good soldier. The expression means to take one share of rough treatment, to suffer or endure affliction together. It actually means suffer hardship in company with. You in a foxhole? You don't want to be in there alone. You want somebody in there with you. Learn how to endure hardship. I'm reminded of the scripture, they that endure to the end shall be saved. I think the word is hupomone, which you would say hupomone. You would say jalapeno. I would say jalapeno. You would say potpourri. I would say potpourri. You would say tomato. I would say tomato. You would say pecan. I would say pecan. It's all how you see it. Can I get an amen? But I've learned to, to say things with syllables. So that's how I, I look at a word. It's syllables. That's why I struggle with some of the language down here. It's a little different from where I'm from. But it's all right. Take, take hardship together. Learn how to handle things together. I don't like people that wimp out too easy. Get born again and just quit. you got to stay with this thing. You're going to have some hardship. You're going to have some hard times. You know what those are called? Test. This is a test of the Holy Ghost broadcasting system. It's how you get through this test is going to matter. Amen. Everything we go through with the hardships about tests. And I found out a long time ago, if you don't pass it, you get to take it again. Amen. So you want to pass that test. Hallelujah. Amen. On Memorial Day, remember him and them with our time. That's what you'll do this weekend. Remember him and them with our talent. Remember him and them with our treasure. Him and them with our thoughts. And remember him and them in our task. Of all the wars that I, it's, the older I get, the more history I want to know. The more I want to study. The more I want to figure out. And all the wars, the great one that changed the way we think and speak is World War II. This was a time when good and evil contended for the world. The largest things were at stake. I watched a show last week called Operation Mince Meat. And if you're not seen World War II in Britain had to fool the Nazis about where they would land. And they were telling them they were going to land in Greece when they landed in Sicily. And they took a man's body, a man, a man who had died, and they put a, uh, uh, fake notes in his attache case so when the Nazis found it, they would think that Great Britain, and it was their one chance to change the whole war. This one operation shifted the whole war for Britain against the Nazis. Amen. So when, I, when I'm watching this and I'm reading about this war, it's this war that I want to especially note and remember. In 48 months, four years of World War II, there were 1,078,162 Americans who lost their lives. With 407,000 deaths or 6,639 Americans dying in combat each month, each month of the war, 6,600 Americans died in that war. These are staggering numbers. Americans in the field never faltered. Even after 19,000 American troops died at the Battle of the Bulge in December of 1944, or the 13,000 that died most in hand-to-hand -hand combat taken Okinawa, the Americans persevered, their courage and their sacrifice knew no bounds, and under a steadfast commander-in-chief, Franklin Roosevelt and his generals, Eisenhower, Bradley, MacArthur, Patton, we would have victory. And we all know, and the world will know, even the French cannot forget that without our contribution to the war, civilization as we know it would not have survived. 
at a cocktail party in Washington, D.C., in the middle of a diplomatic haggling over Iraq, an American congressman said to a high-ranking French diplomat who was in his sophisticated and French way criticizing American policy in Iraq for being self-interest, the man said to the Frenchman, Sir, do you speak German? The French diplomat, taken back and not really understanding the question, said no. To which the soldier said, the congressman said, you're welcome. We'd all be speaking German had our soldiers not stood up. Can I get an amen? Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the soldiers that went into battle. Lord, with you in their hearts, nor they may not come back, and some did not. We give you praise for this Memorial Day. Help us to remember and share it with our kids. It's more than wearing just red, white, and blue. It's more than saying the pledge. God, on this day, things changed for us. On World War II, it changed. Every war changed. It affected families. God, toughen our nation once again. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, somebody give God praise in here. I say it to you again, be a good follower. Be familiar with the people around you. You have friends for a reason. Amen. Prepare to fight a good fight of faith. Hallelujah. In front of you is a tithe and offer an envelope. Be faithful in your giving. Your giving is so important in your own personal life. Amen. And so before our uh, servant leaders go through the building, I want to recognize and allow him to share. You, when you said what you said to me about what you were going to say, I almost said it. Because you're so right, Pastor Bob, on this, this point about the war. Uh, this little, would y'all welcome Pastor Bob Woods? Come on. I don't need to say it. Oh, I need you to say it. <laughs> I love you, when he was throwing out all those compliments to me about the way I talk, he didn't know I was going to have the, or he did know, he should have known I was going to have the mic at the end. But anyway, so I want to just share something that I, shared with Pastor Jerry, and uh, I grew up uh, as what some people would refer to as a military brat. My father was in the Air Force for 23 years, and I grew up on a military base all the way up until I was uh, 17 when he uh, retired from the United States Air Force. And uh, one of the scriptures in Joshua, when um, they took the stones and they placed the stones on the other side of the uh, river, they said, this is for your children to remember. Don't forget that. Because uh, I remember the importance of honoring veterans and honoring our country and honoring our flag. Every uh, day, if you were on the road on a military base back then, I'm not sure if they still do it today, but back then, uh, they would play revelry at 4.30 p.m. at the end of every day. And if you were on the road, you would hear it. You would know at 4.30 you were to pull your car over. And if you were in uniform, you were to get out and salute every single day. And as a kid, you don't really understand it. You see it. Just like you see your parents going to work, you don't really understand it until you become a parent and then you go to work. Many people today don't uh, have a father. They never see their father go to work, never see their father polish their boots or get ready for work the next day. And so that's one of the reasons why they don't remember to go to work. And so remembering and honoring memorials is super important. And so my, my uh, wife's father was in the United States Navy. She's very patriotic. Every, every chance, I, I love this morning seeing your girls and seeing the worship team with red, white, and blue. Just any opportunity we get as parents and as adults is to uh, represent, um, you know, our, our country, but also the freedom that we have to, to worship, but to our children. And so when the man came and played the bagpipes this morning and the flag was standing there, trust me, the kids that were on the front or in the church this morning, they may not understand it, but if you train up in the, a child as the way in which they should go, then it won't depart from them. So with that being said, as a kid, I would see my dad uh, on special occasions like Halloween, stuff like that. They, he would jump out of an airplane with a parachute and drop candy. 
But what I never knew, what I didn't know, excuse me if I get a little emotional talking about my father, <clears throat> what I didn't know about him is that he had made jumps uh, as what they call a forward advanced soldier um, behind enemy lines before they had GPS. He would jump out and call in airstrikes at the end of the Korean War and at the beginning of the Vietnam War. And I only found that out because he was in an elite group that's on the internet. I found that out after my dad took his life in 2009. And what I want to tell you is, is that some men lost their lives on the battlefield, and we honor them. And we're not trying to rob valor from men that suffer from PTSD, that lose their lives because of war at a later date. And, 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 and we, we should not forget <coughs> anyone whose service has created PTSD, including firemen, police officers, people like that. My father could not sleep with my mother because he would have uh, terrible terror uh, nightmares at night. He'd go into convulsions, but he would never, ever talk about it. And, uh, and so when, uh, when, when he took his life, um, Memorial Day has, has taken on a whole new meaning for me. And just thinking about what men and women go through because of the horrors of conflict and the horrors of, of war. And again, uh, some of the men that are, they survived, and women, but the battle continues on in their mind. And there's many Christian organizations and veterans organizations that are here to help people if they would be willing to talk about it. But to this day, and then I'll close, and I hate to end with this statistic, but it's the truth, is that 22 veterans every day commit suicide. Every day. And so uh, one of the things that we need to really continue to do is what we're doing today is uh, honoring veterans and never forgetting that word, never forget. And never forget that your children are watching and they're learning. And I, I'll never forget what I was taught pulling over on the side of the road day after day after day. It didn't mean much then, but it means a lot now. Anyway, thank you for giving me an opportunity to share, and I'm glad that we're here on Memorial Day. So God bless you guys. That needed to be said, amen, to remind people that not all just that passed there, but they passed and they got back. And I appreciate those who have, again, Veterans Day we'll also honor, but to appreciate those who have fought for our nation, continue to do so. If I get our servant leaders to come up real quick, amen, you should have had already time to have doubled your offering. <clears throat> amen. We appreciate your faithfulness in this house. Appreciated the bagpipes. Hey, man, I mean, there's something about them. And uh, not only that, we, you get opportunity to minister to Richard, the guy that plays the bagpipes. You know, sometimes we look at him as just a whole instrument. He's not. He's a man who needs to be, be in this church at times. And when he's here, he lives in Belleville. So he drives over to come over to be with us. And we got to talk to him in the back. And I think it's very, very important. Hey, Amen. As we give today, we're believing God for Jobs and better jobs. More money, less hours. Benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor and success to the kingdom. Amen. Y'all welcome Pastor David as he comes to close us out.